Hello everyone and welcome back to yet another ad hoc video and today I'll be giving my opinion on the recent press report regarding PP405 and the phase 2A results as there are many people in my audience who are asking for my take on this news. So we're here on this article published to Business Wire titled quote Palaz Pharmaceuticals announces positive phase 2A clinical trial results for PP405 in regenerative hair loss therapy unquote. And this seems to be an official announcement because if you go to Pelage's official website, you can see it listed under their press section. Anyway, the Business Wire article notes that the Phase 2A clinical trial for PP405 was a randomized control trial that enrolled a total of 78 men and women with androgenetic alopecia. Subjects were given either PP405 or a placebo topical. Now, from the description of what I can gather from the clinical trial FDA website, PP405 is being used as a gel of sorts at a 0.05% concentration. And if I had to guess, they're probably using HPMC, which is hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose for delivery. So subjects applied PP405 or the placebo to their scalp once daily for four weeks out of the 12 week trial. Now the wording here seems to suggest that after week four, they stopped applying PP405. Now, this study's primary endpoint was safety, where they noted no severe or life-threatening adverse reactions. Furthermore, there was no systemic absorption detected in the subject's blood. Now, the article does mention some kind of efficacy marker here, but really it isn't anything too significant, but I'll read it out anyway. So, 31% of those treated with PP405 had a greater than 20% increase in hair density compared to 0% of patients in the placebo group. Now, this is very early, too early for us to actually assess what's going on, and the article attempts to spin this in a positive way. So it states that, quote, typically visible hair regrowth requires 6 to 12 months of continuous therapy, suggesting PP405 may yield a more rapid clinical response than current treatments, unquote. Now, I don't think that's fair to say. Maybe it could be the case that PP405 causes hair growth to happen sooner, but this is very, very early into the clinical trial. It could just be due to chance that those 30% of people in that group, in the PP405 group, had that improvement just by sheer chance. Another thing to consider is that we don't get any data on what happens past week 12. So we have no idea if those gains hold, improve, or reverse once treatment stops. There's no insight into how PP405 performs, at least at the moment, with longer use, and that is obvious. One thing I don't like is that we do not get photos in many of these press reports. It's not just with Pelage but with other companies too. And it would be nice if we had some sort of photo trichogram where we could see these improvements to see if it really is all that dramatic. And if I had to guess, probably not, right? I don't think the regrowth that those 30% of people got, 31% of people got, such that they had a 20% increase in density, maybe it wasn't even cosmetically significant because we have to remember, right? When we're doing density count, we're simply looking at the number of hair follicles or the number of hair rather in square centimeter. And that hair can include terminal hair, right? Strong hair. It could include intermediate hair, but also it could include vellus hair. And remember, we can't do anything with vellus hair. We can't style it, at least with intermediate or quote unquote miniaturized or partially miniaturized hair and terminal hair. You can do something cosmetically to, you know, style it because you can actually see it with your eyes, right? There's something to make use of. And with vellus hair, those qualities are just completely absent. It's thin, wispy, colorless hair. But under a photo trichogram, you can easily factor that into hair density by simply counting it, right? Now, if they talked about terminal hair density, right, or total hair count, by counting only terminal hairs or intermediate and terminal hairs, right? That kind of changes the sort of, you know, math here, right? That which is increasing. But because they don't really specify, we can't really make any speculation here. We can only take it by its literal meaning that there was an improvement in hair density. And if that's the case, that means 
maybe the increase in hair count in that area that it would increase the density could be mostly from vellus and intermediate hairs. And if it's mostly vellus hairs, that's certainly not like a good look, right? Because once again, you cannot do much with vellus hairs. But that's not what I'm saying. All I'm saying here is that we don't have enough information on this article for it to be really anything groundbreaking. So I really wish they specified the vellus versus terminal hair counts and whether these changes were actually noticeable to patients outside a microscope. And I want you guys to remember that PP405 is a mitochondrial pyruvate carrier protein inhibitor that blocks this specific protein. When this happens, pyruvate builds in the cytosol and the metabolism of the cell is altered such that something called integrated stress response forces the cell to kind of use a backup energy process where they use lactate dehydrogenase, an enzyme, to convert pyruvate into lactate. And it has been observed that this increase in lactate and perhaps other genes that are activated lead to the initiation of a new antigen growth phase. It also leads to a pseudo-hypoxic environment, which seems to stimulate hair follicle stem cells. We have some foundational studies from the Pelage team, such as the works of Dr. William Lowry and colleagues, as well as another study that we can look at. So the articles are, quote, lactate dehydrogenase activity drives hair follicle stem cell activation, unquote, published in 2017 by William Lowry and colleagues. And we also have, quote, inhibition of pyruvate oxidation as a versatile stimulator of the hair cycle in models of alopecia, unquote, published in 2021 by Dr. William Lowry and colleagues. And this was all published to Nature. We also get this understanding, a similar understanding at that, from an ex vivo study titled, quote, activation of the integrated stress response in human hair follicles, unquote, by Derek Pai and colleagues. And in this particular paper by Pai and colleagues, they're using ex vivo human hair follicles. So they went to a human being, they took out their hair follicles, and they're examining it and treating it with a specific solution. And the solution that they're using is UK5099, and this is a compound similar to PP405, because UK5099 is also a mitochondrial pyruvate carrier protein inhibitor. And here, essentially you have two groups, right? You have the human hair follicles that are treated with a placebo vehicle, so there's no active ingredient. And then you have human hair follicles that are treated with UK5099, a compound similar to PP405. And what they observed was that certain genes associated with ATF4 are upregulated, some more so than others. And some of these genes involve in growth, cellular metabolism, proteins, and other pathways that are relevant in lactate production. We come to an understanding that ATF4 is a transcription factor protein that connects or binds, rather, to specific areas on your DNA, which regulate what genes or rules are expressed in that specific cell, of that specific tissue, in that specific organ. And the organ in this, you know, discussion would be the human hair follicles, because, yes, hair follicles are mini organs. ATF4, as Pai et al. writes, is activated by stressors like amino acid deprivation and endoplasmic reticulum stress, which triggers something called the unfolded protein response, which attempts to restore proteins back to normal working order and restore normal metabolic processes to the cell. However, it has been detailed that prolonged endoplasmic reticulum stress may lead to cellular dysfunction and even cell death. And mitochondrial inhibition, particularly this mitochondrial pyruvate inhibition, causes this system to be activated. So that sounds like some bad news, right? And I think there were some articles out there where Dr. William Laurie, in the initial stages when they were studying PB405 in vitro, so in a petri dish with other hair follicles, they had some concerns that, oh, we don't know if PB405 is going to destroy those hair follicles. And it seems as of now that that's not going to be the case, right? It doesn't seem like PP405 is destroying hair follicles. But with that in mind, we don't know if PP405 is something that you should cycle or if it's something that can be used indefinitely on a daily basis. This clinical trial is way too short to hint 
either of this being the case. But if I had to guess, you would probably not want to use PP405 chronically. And this is just my opinion. So I don't think, you know, and you can take my opinion for what it's worth. But I can see PP405 being something you just use for like, let's say a three month period, similar to how L'Oreal Stamoxidine is used for a three month period and then you stop and then you cycle back on and then you stop, so on and so forth. You would probably use PP405 to ideally reactivate hair follicles that are dormant or maybe increase the hair follicle stem cell activity in vellus hair follicles that may be metabolically active to some extent, but you know they, they could use some more reinforcement to try to make them become stronger, maybe turn them into intermediate or hopefully terminal hairs. So perhaps this could be a sort of better minoxidil that has the chance to reactivate dormant hair follicles in a way that overrides DHT's damaging effects. This is only speculation on my part. So yeah, I guess the fact that some people in this study saw a maybe greater than 20% density bump after just a month of treatment is cool, but to be more grounded, we need continued dosing, extended follow-up, and a more robust cosmetic endpoint. This is early stages, so it is promising, but it's not a breakthrough as of yet. And right now they're still doing phase 2B, so they're still in phase 2 clinical trial testing, and the testing from what I remember should end at the end of the year, so sometime in December of 2025. Now, just real quick, PB405 already is kind of out, but only for research purposes. There's a company called AbMole, and they have a safety data sheet and a certificate of analysis on PP405. Now, this helps us understand whether or not PP405 could be used in some sort of hydroalcoholic solution. And when you're looking at the material safety data sheet from AbMole on PP405, we see that this compound is stable as a powder at negative 20 degrees Celsius for three years, but only lasts one month at negative 20 degrees Celsius once it's dissolved. And to me, that's a red flag for oxidative or hydrolytic instability in solution, meaning any topical formulation has to account for this rapid degradation. So that's a short half-life that implies that the active compound here breaks down fast unless it's frozen, which kind of raises questions about how Pelage is stabilizing it in their clinical trial formulation. And that's probably why on the clinical trial FDA website, it notes PP405 at a 0.005% concentration being in some sort of topical gel delivery. Because think about it, right? The absence of room temperature stability data in the certificate of analysis and the material safety data sheet isn't an oversight by any means by AbMole, but it's probably a deliberate omission here because if a compound is even moderately stable at room temperature, manufacturers almost always want to include that info because it's a selling point. So the fact that AbMole completely skips over any room temp guidance suggests to me that PP405 is kind of chemically unstable under ambient conditions, which leads to its breakdown very rapidly, probably to hydrolysis if it's in some sort of hydroalcoholic solvent, or maybe it oxidizes quickly when it's exposed to direct sunlight or, or whatever, right? And this is a warning and exactly why it isn't a good idea to just go to a, you know, a gray market lab to get PP405 made for you and then you take the chemical powder and you know mix it up in an ethanol-based topical solution because in reality, most of it might just degrade before you even put it on your scalp. So it could be the case that you need some sort of antioxidant or a bunch of antioxidants in a solution with PP405, maybe have it in an airtight vial and some kind of refrigeration at minimum to preserve its efficacy. Or, which is probably the case, the unique topical gel that Pelage created and gave to the FDA clinical trial investigators to carry out this experiment. In any case, guys, that's it for this video. Hopefully, I gave you some good insights and hopefully, you know, the news isn't a disappointment. I think we have some things to look forward to, but right now, it's not super groundbreaking or terribly 
crazy news. It is slightly good news, but let's keep things in perspective. Anyway, if you got this far in the video, comment in the comment section below. Green hair. Yes, green hair. Anyway, thanks for watching. Peace out.